Okay, so we are going to talk a bit about async I.O. in Python. So um, it's about the async and await keywords that were added a couple of years ago and how we can use them within Python. And a bit about what is the difference between writing async I.O. code and writing threaded code because that's another way of doing concurrency. So all this is about how can we speed up our program? How can we do things in parallel in order to improve the execution speed? So we have quite a bit of different ways of doing concurrency in Python. First, there was multi-threading, which is the easiest way to do concurrency. Uh, then there was multi-processing, which solves an issue if you need more CPU, because one Python process can only consume one CPU. If you need to have multiple CPUs, uh, because your problem is very CPU intensive, then you need multi-processing. Then there's G-Events, not going to talk a lot about that. And then you have a whole lot of event loop based implementations. Like there's Twisted, which is probably the oldest. Then there are a few others. And in 2012, we got async IO. So let's first start with training. So training is pretty easy. You define two functions, in this case, LS and Bob. And then you create two threads, where each time you say first the entry point, the target is LS. Second time you say target is Bob, and you start them. So if we execute this, then you see these two things are running concurrently. You see both print statements, they are nicely interleaved. Now, things become more complex if these threads, if they has, have to um, coordinate with each other, if they have to exchange data somehow. Like, for instance, in this example, you see that there's a global variable, a counter, and both threads are trying to manipulate that variable. So um, first we are doing an increment and then we are doing a decrement. And both threads, you see, they're doing exactly the same thing. And now we can try to execute this. So what you would expect is that for every increment, we do a decrement. So if we would print the value of counter at regular points in time, we would always print the value 0, 1, or 2, depending on when exactly we print the value. So let's try that. That's this script. You see, it's not exactly the case. Right now, we are printing negative values. Then it becomes positive again. And as we go on, we diverge more and more from actually the zero value. So how is this possible? Let's take this function. So very simple function with an assignment and an increment. If we're going to disassemble this function, you can do that in Python by importing the this library. And then you do this dot this, and you uh, pass f, so that you see uh, the bytecode of that fu this function. Then you see that actually for the increment that corresponds with these four instructions, um, that it's not really one instruction. An increment like plus equal zero or plus equal one, sorry, um, consists of these four instructions. Um, it has to do with how the um, the Python interpreter operates on the stack. Um, but it's very interesting. It means that if we have two threads that operate on that same variable, that at any point in time between these instructions, we can go from one thread to the other thread, which means that these two threads can possibly interfere with each other. And that's exactly what's happening uh, in this example. So the way to solve that is by using a lock. So you can create a lock, and you surround these blocks where you modify that shared variable uh, with that with lock uh, context manager. And then you prevent these two threads from manipulating the same variable uh, at the same time. So what is wrong or what is the disadvantage of tr using threads is that when, as soon as you have to uh, manipulate shared data structures, you have to think about locking. And that's something which is very hard to get right. So either you choose to use one global lock, uh, but then you have the risk that um, you lock too often, like things that could go uh, in parallel, that these things become sequential, or you use very, like many small fine-grained locks, like for each data structure you create one lock uh, to, to protect that from being modified by other threads, and then you have the risk of that locking. Uh, there are ways to prevent that, uh, like some, some guidelines and so on, but it's very hard to get right. And then threads, they have some overhead, not a lot, 
Uh, so it's, it's not really a main reason not to use threads, but still they have a bit of overhead. I should also mention that instead of uh, using shared data structures, you can also um, not share data between threads, but use some kind of message passing. So these threads, they can communicate over a queue. And so if one thread has to pass data to another thread, you can send it over the queue and serialize it. That's a way to prevent uh, using logs and prevent these issues. Uh, but it's also a whole different way of programming. So let's come to AsyncIO. Uh, we're going to have a look at how we can do these things in AsyncIO. So here we have also two functions, function one and function two. And we are going to run these in parallel and do the same thing, the same increments and decrements. Now, you see that these functions are not normal functions. There is async in front of the dev keyword, which means that it's an asynchronous function. And then there is an await as well. Now, what the await keyword here actually means is that that is a place where it's fine to go from one function to the other. So basically, we are in control when we do the context switching between these two functions. So if we are now going to execute this, these two will run concurrently, but the context switch between these two functions, they will only happen at the place where we have an await keyword. Uh, there is a sleep that's not important right now, but it's just to make this uh, example work. So let's... This example, you see we always print zero. Uh, that's what you get when you would execute a script. Um, so... The await keyword, actually, it means that it's a place where it's safe for one core team to move to another core team. That's it, basically. Now, in practice, it means a bit more than just that. It also means that you're probably waiting for some I.O. to complete. Because the problem that we typically try to solve with async I.O. is a very I.O. intensive application. And when you have many things going on in parallel, a good point to go from one core team to another core team is when you're idle, when you're not doing anything. Like, for instance, you do a network request, you wait for the response to arrive. In between, you're not doing anything. So that is exactly the right place where it makes sense to go to another core team and resume uh, the execution over there. And so actually, you will go back and forth between all these core teams at the point where you have an await. So you have total control over the context switching. So basically, the difference between threads and coroutines is that threads, they're preemptive, and the operating system decides when to context switch. With coroutines, like what we have in async I.O., uh, we are in control over the context switching. And that means that most of the time, we don't have to use locks because we know what pieces of code are run atomically and won't be interrupted. That's exactly where we don't have an await. And so um, it's much easier to get your code right. Uh, with threading, there's a lot of chance that you get things wrong, that in production at some point, things will start breaking. Uh, with async I.O., it's easier to get things right. Now, important to know is that all of this runs actually on top of an event loop. So the coroutines are an abstraction on top of an, event, of, a, of an event loop. An event loop, that's a very simple mapping where you map I.O. completion events to callbacks. So like, for instance, uh, when a network socket becomes ready for reading or writing, when you receive mouse or keyboard events, these are events, and then you specify a callback that will execute um, when that event happens. And that's literally this while true. So you wait for a file descriptor to become ready, file descriptor maps to an event, and then you call the corresponding callback, and you keep doing this in a loop. So if you keep this in mind, then you see that we only run one callback at a time, right? And that's really the advantage of event loops. These callbacks, they won't interfere with each other. So we run everything in one thread, one callback at a time. Um, I've said uh, there is no complicated synchronization like data locking and so on. It's also pretty easy to debug because if you put a break statement in your code, your whole event loop will freeze and you can inspect the state of all coroutines. Uh, and this is great also for handling many connections in parallel. Like if you have thousands of connections, like WebSockets connections, and they're idle most of the time, 
then event loop is perfect because you can wait for so many file descriptors at the same time your operating system can do that for you and then you execute the callback uh, that corresponds to the uh, incoming um, network connection from where you receive a message and that is of course much cheaper than having one thread for every single connection one important thing to know though is that you should not mix async IO code with traditional or like the typical blocking code that you find in other applications. Like for instance, if you use the request library for doing network requests, that's what many people do in Python, they will block. You do a request and your statement will, your request will get statement will wait for the response to arrive. If you try to do that in an event loop, your whole event loop will freeze. So you cannot do that. There are workarounds to still execute that kind of code, but it's best to avoid it if you can. Um, so we shouldn't, we should not do blocking I/O. Instead, we should do non-blocking I/O uh, by registering a callback in that event loop, which will then execute um, when a response arrives. For instance. Now, these coroutines are an abstraction on top of event loops. It's pretty nice so that you don't have to think about all these callbacks, because otherwise you would end up with a very ugly code. Um, so this is an example of what, um, it's really hypothetical because this library doesn't exist, but this is what a database query would look like in async IO code. So we do a query, we wait for the response because there's like a networking in between, and when the response arrives, that thing will be assigned to users at this point. So the await keyword here means that we wait for the response to arrive, we return to the event loop. The event loop can then do other things in between. And when the response arrives, the event loop will resume the execution of this function. So it's like kind of a state machine. The, the await will suspend it and later on we resume it. So we do actually two things. With await we say we can go to another function, but we're also waiting for the response. We can also use the await to call another coroutine. Like for instance, here we have a main function and we have a get users function. And the main function is calling get users. But get users is an async function, which means that if you call it, you don't get a response, but actually you get a coroutine object. And you have to use a wait in front of it in order to get the actual um, result. So the await keyword is very often used to await the outcome of another coroutine. Um, you see at the very bottom there is async.io.run. That is how you start an async.io program. You need to have an event loop that gets started and that will like, operate these uh, coroutines. That's what the very last line is doing. Uh, yeah, so async and await, they very often go together like you see in this example. Something else which is important to know is how to run coroutines in parallel because that's the whole point of using async IO. You want to parallelize stuff. And one way of doing it is by using async IO.getter. So async IO.getter is a way to uh, wait for the outcome of multiple coroutines at the same time. Uh, in this case, we spawn the get users coroutine twice. And when both are done, these, um, the execution of the main function will uh, go on. So actually, you can think of async.io.getter as a join in threads. You're joining multiple things uh, together. And actually, I like this way because of, of doing concurrency. I like this because you have some kind of symmetry. You have a place where you start things in parallel and things come back nicely together. That's what you actually want. You don't want to fire something and then forget about it. It's, it's very important, actually, to do the join in order to get some kind of symmetry. Um, if you cannot do that, then you could actually do async.io.create task that will spawn the coroutine, and the execution in the main function still goes on, but if later on you decide you need a response, then you can still await for the task. And you could actually do users equals await task to capture the outcome of that coroutine. Uh, but I think it's pretty important to actually not just spawn tasks and not wait for the response, but uh, instead really 
uh, wait for the response because that way you can do proper um, exception handling. If there is an exception raised in get users using try except, uh, you can capture them around the await statement. Then uh, there is also async with and async for, which are pretty nice. So the with block you probably know as a context manager. That's something a code that you execute before and after the block, very typically used for um, establishing a connection and closing the connection or uh, allocating resources and releasing resources. So that's what a with block is doing. Async with is what you do if any of these two blocks the enter or the release involve async code. And in this case, that's the case. Uh, establishing a connection has to be asynchronous because it takes some time to establish the connection and you need an async with in order to do that. Then async for is something you typically see when you're consuming asynchronous data stream. Like for instance, you select the users from a database table, the uh, entries are all transmitted over the wire, over the network, and you receive them in chunks, not all at once. So you don't want to wait until the whole response arrives before you start processing, but you want to start processing things as soon as possible as they arrive. So that means that every iteration of the for loop involves possibly waiting for the network, network response to arrive. And so that needs to be asynchronous. That's when you have an async for. And these two are typically things that you see uh, that you have to use for many async I.O. libraries. Um, then there are executors, which is also something good to know about. So this is something you use whenever you have to run traditional uh, blocking code. It could be either a situation where you have um, a blocking I.O. Uh, library, like requests, or it could be a situation where you have very CPU intensive code. Um, in that case also, you would block the event loop. If you have something which is very computational expensive, you could run it in a other thread and um, have the main thread, the main event loop go on and respond to incoming connections. So in this case, the executor will run on another thread or on another process, and the await can still be used to wait for the outcome of that uh, piece of code. Then one warning, um, don't turn every call into an async call. It's what people often get wrong when they start with async IO because some people think that at some point every function will become async because at some point every function will involve doing IO, right? And often that is the case but doing I.O. doesn't mean that you have to wait for the I.O. For instance, in the case of a logging server, imagine that you're logging to a remote server, then um, you don't have to wait for these log logging messages actually to be transmitted. You want the logging to happen in your server, but you want your execution to go, go on as soon as possible. And so instead of using an await in front of your logging calls, it's best to implement your logging framework in a way that you uh, push all your logging messages into an async queue, and somewhere else you have then a core team that consumes the queue and flushes the messages uh, over the network. And so that way your functions don't have to be async, not necessarily. Um, something else here, which I think is important, um, we should try to separate the code that is doing I.O. from the code that is doing computational stuff, if that's possible. For instance, if you are uh, doing a parsing library where you are parsing data that's completely, um, that can be written completely independent from the I.O. layer. And so if you can separate these things, then you can have code that is completely synchronous and an asynchronous code around it that calls the synchronous code. And that's totally fine. So try to avoid ending up in a situation where every function becomes async. This is next actual example. I'm not going to say a lot about this because later today Tom Christie will talk about HTTPX, which is an async IO library for doing HTTP calls. So if you're interested in that, then stay for a few more talks, then uh, we will discuss this. 
But you see that here as well, we have the async with block for establishing the connection and then the await to wait for the response is something that you very often see with these async libraries. Then something else which is good to know is that if you're experimenting with async IO, um, you cannot, oh, you cannot uh, just use an await keyword in your interactive shell. If you try that, there would be a syntax error because you can only use an await in an asynchronous function. And it's very cumbersome for trying out async IO code. But there's a solution. IPython does support um, async IO integration, which means that in IPython, you can use the await keyword top level, and then IPython will ensure that the event loops uh, runs. And so it's very great for experimenting. Or you can do Python dash M async IO. It's also very, uh, it's basically the same thing, but then with the normal Python shell. So to conclude, async IO is a pretty great concurrency pattern. Uh, for I.O. heavy applications. Not so much for CPU intensive applications, but if you're dealing with a lot of I.O. and many connections, then async I.O. is great. It's not the easiest to begin with, honestly, uh, but very often when things become more complex, it, it, it is much easier than trying to get right. Um, and then the important pitfalls I would like you to remember, try not to mix um, async I.O. code with blocking I.O. unless you use an executor and try not to turn every call into an async call. So that's what I have. Uh, I don't know whether there are any questions. You can find me on Twitter, on GitHub. Um, sorry? Yeah. Uh, this one. Gather can take as many functions as you want. It, it takes them as positional arguments. You can pass as many core teams as you want together. 